We would like to invite Dr. Jens Krinke, Associate Professor at the Department of Computer Science, University College London, and Director of the Center of Research on Evolution Search and Testing in the Software System Engineering Group to share his view on the state of the art techniques in software engineering and how it will be useful for adoption by industry, especially in Thailand. Dr. Krinke, would you please? Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you everybody in the audience uh, on site and online for attending this presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the theme of this workshop, where we are in automated software engineering and where we might be going or where the industry is going to. I will keep it on a high level, uh, unlike any kind of research talk where I would explain how things work. Here will I will only show you some perspectives on the current state of the art in automated software engineering and highlight at the end a few challenges that are coming up for the industry. Um, so I'm a member um, of the UCL Computer Science Department. Um, I'm also the director for the Center of Research on Evolution Search and Testing, and also in charge of the Software Systems Engineering Masters in Software Engineering. So I, I focus mainly on software development practice, how to analyze software, how to reuse software, and then extracting knowledge from, my, from uh, software repositories. So the main point here is the software development practice. Um, this would not be possible today without the great research that uh, my colleagues have been doing in our uh, software systems engineering group at the Crest Center. I want to highlight some of the people who have been instrumental to some of the stuff that I will be uh, presenting. So for example, we are doing a lot of, of uh, automated software testing. And I think everybody in the group has in one way or another worked on this. Um, well, we will also be focusing on how to apply machine learning and artificial intelligence for software engineering. And in particular, um, Earl Barr was instrumental in that he founded some of the early work in automated code completion. Um, and uh, we also have automated program repair where Sergey Mechtaev is uh, um, producing lots of interesting work there. Everybody of us has been working on testing and I will at some point uh, mention work that is in use at Meta. So it's not an advertisement for Meta. It's only because our former colleagues, Mark Harm and Yui Jia, uh, have been working um, at Meta now for years and have taken our research uh, there for the purposes of automated software testing. So let's start again with where we are. We have talked about automated software engineering, which is basically automating the analysis, design, implementation, and in particular, testing and maintenance of large software systems. The larger a software system is, the more automation uh, we need. And that's the idea also of um, having software produced like in a factory where we introduce more and more automation under the control of humans. One of the main points that makes automation possible and where automation is at the core is continuous integration that you probably all use, where we have set up a pipeline that builds and integrates our system frequently, basically after every single change. And it's core that we have this automated build, including tests to detect any kind of errors, bugs as quickly as possible. So it's important that we have the automation embedded in there. And in, in practice, we have this typical setup that uh, we are just working with changes. When something is changed, the systems are not defined, the continuous integration step works, and then the developers are notified about the results. Now, 
the build and test is usually the problem. How do we do that in an efficient and effective way? And we have a lot uh, heard today about in the interesting uh, panel discussion about how challenging testing actually is. So we heard a lot about unit testing because unit testing is one way to ensure that all the small units work as expected. And in particular, if something happens, well, for example, we heard about the problem of regression testing, it's when one of those unit tests break, we can pinpoint the actual unit that is responsible for the break because we have the direct map of the unit tests to the units. So the idea there is to isolate all of those components, all of the units from each other so that we can look at the components individually. We should not forget the value of the integration tests and for, for the automation is, it's not usually we're doing all the integrate, uh, all the system tests at uh, all the time. We are looking at it more as a smoke test approach. We try after continuous integration, create the program, create the system and run a smoke test, meaning starts to smoke. If it starts to smoke, then we have done something wrong to the microwave and uh, we turn it off and check immediately what, what's happening. Now, the, the concept of a smoke test is important on this, this level because what we see as a smoke coming out of a system is, for example, a crash after we started it or any kind of exception. So we can observe the smoke coming out of our uh, software system whenever something goes wrong without the actual need to write a dedicated test that checks the expected outcome with the actual outcome. And we have heard a lot about how the changes are integrated and in the continuous integration, we are checking them usually by building and testing and also then via humans or for example, Sonar Cube to check that we are not introducing new problems. The goal there is that we never break the build. We never make the tests fail. So all these changes must be reviewed before they're integrated into the main branch. So only those reviewed changes are usually uh, integrated. So this is what we see as the typical modern code review cycle. Um, although it's actually more about not just modern code reviews, but the, the modern way of developing software. We have an author that authors a change and submits it for the validation into the continuous integration. And it's not just validated by the tests or by the build and the continuous integration, but also by reviewers who are approving those changes. And in particular, when we look at at the typically encountered problem that there's not enough testing or there's little testing, we still can have the human reviewer check for problems in the source code um, without actually running the software. So the problem there is that the humans are actually not very good at this job. When humans are looking at um, changes, they are not very good at finding those bugs and flaws. They're not very good at spotting uh, the code smells. Now, automated systems are much better at finding those kinds of bugs and flaws. And therefore, uh, we, we, and we heard that today in a panel discussion, how, for example, Sonar Cube is used to check for flaws and problems in the software. And if we employ these kind of services and systems, instead of humans, they can focus on, so the humans can focus on what's really important, keeping the code in a good quality as in how a human would perceive it. The humans are no longer required to run the software, test the software. We want to automate as much as possible. And therefore, we have lots of these kind of review bots. So if you use the GitHub infrastructure where you are 
um, using the uh, continuous integration services like the GitHub Actions on GitHub, you can push all your changes, all your pull requests through a lot of review bots. They are plentiful there and they cover a wide range of checks and languages. Now, the problem there is to figure out which ones are useful. So if we uh, look at the uh, um, snapshot that I did some time ago, we had 785 different bots or, or, or apps to check which ones are useful. Because the problem is a lot of these things do something, but they're not very useful. A lot of th those bots come actually from student projects that have written these things. And it's quite a challenge to figure out what are the really helpful ones because we don't have much of a guidance. What we can rely on usually is the more often something is used and maybe even the more expensive something is used, the maybe the, the more useful it is. So we heard about the Sona uh, Cube approach that um, our four companies have used. They've used the free version and Sonar also is offering the service as a, as a service again, where it runs on their infrastructure and can then apply these automatically on all pull requests. So that's basically what we heard where we are. And that is the state of the art, uh, I would say, in general software development. We are reviewing changes and we try to test as much as possible with the support of a lot of the service and infrastructure we have available. Now we're gonna talk uh, about where, well, practice and research is going and what you can expect in the future. And I will give one example that will impact um, every software development company, in particular SMEs, um, quite dramatically, in my opinion, which is GitHub Copilot, uh, which I will um, at the end say. So this is not an advertisement for GitHub Copilot, but I think it highlights how software development will change. So we talked very much about the problem of testing. And the automated testing is also at the core of software engineering research. We have separate conferences for software engineering in general and just for testing. And we have research groups just focusing on, on testing. So one, one, there are two books that I really like, uh, both coming out of Google because they have this huge amount of experience. One is about the general software engineering at Google, and they have a separate book about testing at Google. What has been coming out of research and has, well, ha gained some traction is the goal of automated uh, unit test generation. So basically generating tests for code that you have written on a click on a button. The most well-known and most Evolve system that is called EvoSuite, which is a system that automatically generates tests for uh, Java. So Java unit tests. I'm going to not explain about how this actually works, but you should keep in mind that um, these tests are generated by automatically generating inputs for method invocations and a combination of methods to execute as much as possible of the class that um, we're trying to generate tests for. So it it's, tries to maximize the coverage and capturing the data um, to actually reach this coverage. There are a lot of well, let's say interesting and advanced research problems behind to make these tests as small as possible. But this kind of automatic test generation has become quite uh, useful. One element there is also, this is specific for um, basically regression testing because it executes the implemented code and captures the state 
of the uh, behavior in test cases, because if a suite itself cannot decide whether a result is correct, whether it's the expected results, but it can capture it in a way that if you do a change in the future, you will automatically see whether a unit has changed its behavior. Now, EvoSuite originally is for Java, and I think in Java, it's much more simple to have this kind of automatic test generation, but we now have um, other languages that are supported by automated uh, unit test generation. One example is Penguin, which does something very similar for Python. So um, while a lot of what's coming out of research is just focusing on a single programming language, over time, we will see this in other languages. Now, if we stick him back from um, unit testing to more system testing, then we have the same there too. We might know of, of the principal uh, systems like monkey test for Android application, which exercises GUIs as much as possible with random data. And this goes back to what we know as fuzz testing, where we are just throwing a lot of input at systems. And hopefully by giving the systems invalid, malformed, or unexpected um, inputs, we try to reveal software defects. Because on the level of the system tests, we have the smoke test uh, oracle. If we throw something unexpected in the microwave and it starts to smoke, then something has gone wrong and we have to investigate what is happening. Now you can say, oh, this is a, it's a problem. Can it scale the automated uh, system test generation? Now, one example that it's very much able to scale and it is extremely useful in practice is what was the Sapiens project um, at Meta, uh, which came out of uh, the research uh, in our group and which Mark Harmon and Eugia took to Facebook, now uh, Meta at that time. So if we can automatically generate tests now, let's go a step further. What we have now as a trend is what is called automated program repair. The aim there is that when we detect a bug, that it's fixed automatically on the press of a button, instead of having a human investigate and dig into the inners of the software system to first find where the bug is located and then trying to fix it. And usually, if you think about um, um, car repair, well, you try something in the car and see whether the car starts again. And you fix and to, um, stuff in your car and try it out until the car runs. And this is also how automated program repair works because automated program repair usually just applies some kind of transformation to the source code. So and then creates an automatic patch and checks whether um, the test that exposes the bug, that exposes the defect, is now passing without any other test failing. So the repair here is, well, you have to be very careful if you use the term repair because it is not really fixing the bug usually, it generates a, a patch. And a human in the end has to figure out whether this patch is actually fixing the problem. Now for problems in the security realm, like the hard play bug, this generated patch can be deployed quite quickly as soon as a vulnerability occurs. And a proper fix later can be go through all the quality assurance and the investigation by humans. Again, this only works if you have good testing to ensure that the patch that is automatically generated is not breaking anything else. Because as software developers, we often know if we fix a bug, we have unexpected and undesired side effects that something else breaks. And what we can do if we have this automated repair and the automated test, why don't we throw it together? We generate automated tests. If we observe some smoke by the automated test, we just um, invoke um, automated, uh, the automated repair for that. And that is also what, again, Meta has been doing. They 
have the automated test generation, Sapiens. And as soon as Sapiens triggers a bug, they have been running automated repair where they generated patches. And those patches are much more simpler than uh, the, re um, the um, research these days is doing because most of the bugs that a company like Meta or large scale companies are encountering, they have encountered before and fixed before. So uh, for example, um, there was a huge study at Ubisoft where they filed every single bug and the fix for it in a huge database. And they were using this database as soon as they would identify a new problem where they had this automated system that would pinpoint to the fix that they have used before so that they can reuse those fix. And in the future prevent that a change will cause a problem that they have seen before. Now, we have talked about automated test generation and automated repair, where little pieces of code are generated. So this is basically under the umbrella of automated code generation. And what would be helpful if we just give a robot a description of what we want to do, and the robot generates the code for it. And that is exactly what GitHub Copilot is doing. Um, I mean, I can at least see the audience, uh, and, uh, the physical audience. Um, I don't know whether uh, you all have heard about GitHub Copilot, but um, as of yesterday, uh, GitHub Copilot is available to everybody. So while I was preparing this presentation, suddenly um, GitHub was announcing that Copilot is now available for everybody. It's now becoming a paid service. So I, as a person who has participated in the beta test, now have 60 days where I can still use it. And then I have to pay for it too. But GitHub Copilot works basically by taking all the public code on GitHub and learning from that code. And not just from the code itself, but also from the comments around it and for all the, the, the um, documentation. And surprisingly, it's extremely powerful. Until I used Copilot myself, I was extremely skeptical about whether machine learning for software engineering can really be that helpful. And actually it is. So imagine I just uh, write something that I just want to download a web page and ask GitHub Copilot to uh, generate the code for me. Okay, I've written that documentation and GitHub Copilot generates the whole code for me. One element there is we will look at the code and actually does not do what I actually wanted, but it gives me a good framework because what it has actually generated, it has not generated the code to really download the web page, but what it does, it downloads the web page and counts the number of bytes that has been received. And I would not be happy about how um, the exception as I handled that uh, only um, the code is throwing out the stack trace and then ignores the exception. That's completely wrong how to handle this kind of situation. But still, it's extremely impressive what GitHub Copilot can actually do. Um, and it will be extremely helpful in repetitive tasks to generate the code that we know how to write, um, but that takes us longer to write. What people often have not yet seen is what GitHub Copilot can also do, which will help us in the software development in the future. Namely, they have two functions, explain and translate. In explain, you can let Copilot explain to you what a piece of code does. What's listed here is the explanation given by Copilot on the code we just have seen. 
and is given a description what it actually does. Now, the description identifies what the code actually does in the end, that it counts the number of bytes read and returns them. The other one is translate. Now, if I say to Gita Copa that this is Java code, now translate this to JavaScript, more or less the same as before. Now, again, we have to be very careful in human, as a human to, to review what is happening. Because if I do the same for Python, I get this response, much shorter code as usual for Python, but looking at it, I'd see that something is not quite right. This is not the same code. What it actually just does is opens the URL and gets the, the code for the uh, um, access to that page. It does not do the same. Now, GitHub Copilot has already been very much, much successful. Um, there was an article um, in October last year that at this point of time, 30% of all code is already written with some kind of A assistance. And Copilot is one of these examples where we have a quite capable system. Now, going back to our main problem these days, namely testing and how to write tests. Well, even somebody has figured out how to use Copilot to automatically generate tests. I'm not going through that, we don't have time. So here's the URL for that blog post. And that's something you can all try out. So instead of using these complicated systems to uh, generate test code, we can even use something like GitHub Copilot to generate tests. So what's the future development cycle? With all these uh, support from machine learning and AI systems, well, we have seen and what we're already using is that we are getting help for the code review by having bots that automatically do the review for us. And we have also seen that we can actually generate code by bots. So we have the cycle that we have bots on both sides. Isn't that the ideal case that in the end, we don't need any human to write our code and test it. We're back to, we just tell our bots what we want to do and to automatically test it. Now, we are not there yet because it's not the real case that we can replace both sides at the same time. If we have um, a re um, an automatic reviewer, then it still only reviews the human and the human has to use the guidance. And if we have automatically generated test codes, we still need a human um, to um, review and check the generated code. Also, then there's this huge issue. Can we actually trust machine learning and software engineering? Everybody knows that the code on GitHub is not just consisting out of, of diamonds of software development knowledge. There are also other pieces. Now, what is coming out of the machine learning if we're just not sorting out what's not diamond? We have this classical term of garbage in, garbage out. An example of that is that um, if you're using GitHub Copilot, the problem is if you're generating security relevant code, it's not secure. So one of the observations is that if you uh, try to do some kind of a user password validation and generate the code, the code that Copilot generates has an SQL injection vulnerability. So we need our experts. And I'm gonna finish with the challenges to the software industry, uh, software industry with these advanced software engineering uh, technology. Now the question there is who actually has the resources to adopt and advance those cutting edge technologies? All these cutting edge technologies are only coming from the large companies, Google, Microsoft, and Meta, because only they have the resources to advance it. Small companies cannot advance these cutting edge technologies, we are left with using them. Then we have all the services. Now, how can we, we afford adopting the services? We have the cost of the service 
and we have the cost of the training integration. And you have experienced that as companies when adopting uh, Sonar Cube. It's the time you need to adopt it and to change it. And you need the personnel to do that. Um, and the personnel at that time cannot be a productive contributor to your project. And then also you have to pay for all these services. So how many of these services can you actually afford? The other question is how is actually the workforce tra transformed? So if we have the simple jobs replaced by, um, by bots, in the end, do we only need specialists? Is that the end of the interns in companies that help us with simple tasks? And then the question is who trains those specialists? So, and then in the end, well, are we replacing more and more software developers by more and more robots? What is the impact on actual teams? So that was basically it. What I wanted to give you as a high level overview, where we are heading and what the challenges are. So we talked about automated software engineering as the principle of using like a software factory. We talked about the importance of testing and in particular also system testing and, um, and smoke testing. We talked about the cycle in which we are usually now uh, developing software. And then I focused on the generation of code in the second part where the research is going, with automatic test generation and particular systems like GitHub Copilot that will impact our software development, not just individually, but also in terms. And then as a takeaway message, if you use any kind of those artificial intelligence systems, we have always the problem that not everything that comes out of these systems is trustworthy. Thanks a lot. And I don't know whether we have time for uh, questions because I've been keeping you, I think, from lunch. Okay, thanks a lot, Jens, for the um, insightful talk. Now we have a few minutes for Q&A, let's say possibly one or two questions. Um, okay, anybody on the floor has any questions? Okay. Okay, thank you. Dear Jens, uh, after I saw your diagram and, and see your slide, I think if, if we have a patch writer that work automatically by machine learning and, and in your diagram and by this idea, can, can it help the company to do the refactoring? Because after we develop the source code and we used to like the sonar queue to detect the smell and then we use the help for machine learning to do the patch because we, yeah. we know the pattern. I, I, I want to know the idea if this helped. Thank you. Thanks for the question. That's a great question because that is something that uh, research is currently working on and not just research is um, when we spot something that is to be fixed instead of a human can we automatically change it? So if we look at um, checkers like um, PyLint for Python or ESLint for JavaScript, a lot of the, the problems can be automatically fixed. And why does a human have to do that? Um, we have done the kind of studies and for, for a lot of these problems, um, in in uh, Python, we have, for example, black that automatically fix it, but it's better how it is done in ESLint, in JavaScript, because uh, ESLint has this category of fixable problems and it can automatically fix it. Now, these are the ones where fixes are quite straightforward and uh, where we are in a situation where we can actually use them. Now, there are a lot of other things where only a human at this point, up at this point of time, can do it. And the question is: Well, with machine learning, cannot that be changed? And it's not ready for for prime time. 
but research is working on that and they're making progress. Um, one thing, again, that I know from, from Meta is that they have those systems already. They learn from previous code reviews what has been changed, how it has been improved to suggest future improvements, which then can be uh, accepted by a human. However, again, this only works for a large scale company like Meta because they have their own code base that is huge where they can learn from. And they know of the quality in their system. I don't know whether I would like um, automatically generated improvements from something like Stack Overflow, where we know the quality of that code there is actually not very good. So there are challenges we are currently tackling, but I don't think that we are there yet that it actually can be used in industry. A few more years. Okay, thank you. I actually have a one additional question regarding the automate uh, agent to help fix the code, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm looking for, right now I'm hoping that, well, if I understand it correctly, you're trying to optimize the process so that uh, the robot can fix the code, right? But yeah. uh, can we think about a way to actually help improve the code themselves to code better? I think the, the, the objective is a little bit different, right? So right now you're trying to optimize the code to help detect the, the, uh, the errors, right? But what if you yes. also in the process of uh, helping fix the code automatically also help the coder themselves to, to learn to code better? Yes. So, I mean, that's, that's the important observation in, in code review. Why are we doing uh, code review? This is an important way to train and educate um, people on how to make the code better in their quality. And um, with the suggestions that are automatically generated by the bots, they can also be used to improve the the human's abilities to write better code right from the beginning. Because if you, for example, see how SonarCube approaches it, it highlights what's wrong. And you can then check out why SonarCube thinks it's not quite right and why this is a problem. And you, as a human, can be of a different opinion. Maybe it doesn't apply in your situation. But at least you are then educating yourself and you build an argument either, yes, this is exactly what I should do and I will try not to do that in the future again, not the same problem, or I build an argument saying, yeah, in this case, SonarCube is not quite right because there are good arguments why that is not the case. But we, we I think what we have seen um, when systems like SonarCube are adopted, there are a lot of very easily and, and let's say, well, stupid problems that can be easily fixed. And if you look at it as a programmer, you say, of course, this is, is, is wrong. And you make people aware of it, right? At the beginning, this doesn't happen. Um, and therefore, the code review and the, the automatic bots have a huge role in educating programmers and writing better better code. All right, thanks a lot for the answer and questions. I think we run off time um, because the participants um, need to go to take some break before the afternoon session. So um, yeah, let's, uh, let's finish the talk um, for Jens and then I'll hand it back to the MC. Thanks a lot, Jens. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krinke, for the insightful presentation. Now, we have seen what are the states of the art in research and possibly how they will be adopted in practice by the software resumes in Thailand. This would conclude our sharing lessons learned session for today. 
I would like to invite Dr. Shayong Rakit Resakun to give the closing remarks. Ajahn Shayong, would you please? Okay, I forgot that I would have to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit weird. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I will keep it short. So, uh, thanks a lot for all the audience, both on site and on Zoom, and also from Facebook Live. I think we have a successful event in terms of uh, discussing and sharing the ideas. We're going to have this recording of the video available uh, publicly after the event. So yeah, we hope to make even more stronger impact to the software industry. And lastly, uh, I would like to thank all the people who are uh, involved in the organizing this event. The multimedia team worked uh, hard on having these technical uh, difficulties sorted out. Thanks for all the industry partners, Apple Gaming, Cosquare, Roots, and CVC AI to spending their valuable time to be with us today. And um, thank you for all the audience who joined today. And we hope to see you next time. And please feel free to contact us if you need any help or if you're interested in our research. Thank you. Okay. Smile with mask on. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you.